Hi everyone, I'm Mara Webster with sag After Foundation and thank you so much for tuning into another one of our conversations at home today. Um, I want to continue reminding everyone watching these videos that the sag After Foundation is a nonprofit organization which is continuing to raise funds for our COVID-19 emergency assistance fund. This fund is working to support sag After members who are currently out of work due to all of the closed film and television productions right now. So please check out the details below this video and consider supporting if you're able to in any way at all. Um, today, we're incredibly fortunate to be joined by Jennifer Connolly who is currently starring in TNC and tease Snowpiercer. I wanted to start by just asking you about jumping into the second season because I, I know that you guys were already starting to film when, when the shutdown happened and just what that process was like and how that was on your end being on set one day and then just how it gradually trickled in. Um, well, to, to be honest with you, we were, it was near the end of uh, production on the second season, um, and I had actually already finished my work on it. So I was already at home when the news came that they were shutting down production uh, on the second season. That was really, really fortunate for you. I was curious, um, when you first started filming the show, there's obviously with television, there's a unique aspect in that you go in to film the pilot and then there's a period of time which you're, you're sitting between going back to film the rest of the season. And so I was curious if there was time between those two shooting periods that were really useful for you in terms of kind of rediscovering and continuing to evolve the character and, and particularly having had the opportunity to, to live and breathe it for a little bit and see what really worked. Mm -hmm. Uh, this was a slightly different process in that um, we shot a pilot and then in between the time when we filmed the pilot when all the actors left and went home, um, there was sort of a reimagining of the show. So they made some changes um, and um, really by the time we went back to shoot the show, um, it had been we we basically started over basically um so there were there had been a, a big rewrite the sets were different uh the dialogue was different some of the characters some of the actors had different characters um uh wardrobe's different so it, it had all it had really changed i i played the same character and i served the same function um and had basically the same role but um it was manifested differently that's so it was, kind of a, it was kind of a restart in that way. Yeah. And this was the first time that you had gone back to television since I think 2000 when you did The Street. And so I was curious about, you know, the, the difference in the way that you sat and prepared with, with this character and particularly once you had a few of the scripts, because I know that you didn't have the whole season up front, yeah. as opposed to the way that you sit with a film script, because obviously there's a lot of open-ended details when you're preparing for TV. Sure, and that I, I had never experienced that before, and you know, which is one of the things that I found really compelling and exciting about the prospect of doing television is you have that time with the character. But yes, when you don't have all the scripts starting initially, it's different than a film where you have the document, and that document might change a little bit, but you kind of have a basic set of parameters. And here, you know, it's like the, the horizon keeps is moving and you and there are more things that you know that you learn about your character I'll say that Graham Manson who's our um, showrunner um, he was great with me in terms of you know talking about where the character was going to go and things that potentially were going to happen so that I could you know integrate them into my thinking as I was you know as we were beginning in the, in the earlier episodes yeah, and given that you, you didn't have all the scripts and, and the writers were kind of responding in, in, to some degree even for things that had already been filmed as you were shooting and, and there wasn't a definitive show bible, were there, were there moments where you felt like you really had to make convictions, make strong choices for your character, but sometimes still be prepared to pivot and change those along the way depending on the information that you got throughout the process? Yeah, I mean, I was never, I never felt blindsided by anything. There was never any like huge revelation that they hadn't, you know, that they hadn't kind of, I think the really big choices they had, um, you know, they had been processing those ideas for a long, for a while. Um, so they shared those ideas with me in advance. Um, but yeah, for sure. There were things that came in that I thought, wow, okay, that's interesting. I didn't see that coming. Um, but it was, it was a really, f I really enjoyed the experience. It was challenging, but I really enjoyed it. 
Yeah. Was there, was there a unique challenge in going back to television with, with the way that you're building a rapport with multiple directors as opposed to just like a very close tight knit relationship with, with one person. And, you know, you, I imagine that you get to a certain point as well where you kind of know your character very in depth, but someone new is stepping in and, and giving you that direction. So it's an interesting collaborative, collaborative relationship. Yeah. It, 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 um, it was funny because, you know, after the first two episodes, I thought, oh God, no, I don't want a new director. You know, you just, you feel like you've just sort of gotten up and running. And, um, but then of course the next director comes in and you go, oh, this is great too. Um, and I think we had really good fortune to have had a really good group of directors. So, um, and we had a producing director and we had our showrunner there all the time. So it felt like there was continuity as we were, as we were working. And it was, kind of, and then it became, kind of, then you could just sort of, there was enough continuity that you felt like you could just enjoy the differences in each director, you know? Yeah. And what, what was that collaborative relationship like with Graham once you were on set and once you were filming in the way that he would kind of make sure that you had all the tools and all the information, like you were saying for your character, but also just in the way that he was kind of mapping out what that space on set was going to be for everyone and making sure it was really conducive. He was, I found him to be incredibly collaborative and um, very accessible. You know, he really had his hands full. It's a big, it's a big show. There are a lot of characters. There are a lot of storylines. Um, so, you know, he had a very full plate. Um, but new scripts would come in and, you know, I'm someone who's sort of, I don't know. I got a lot of questions. <laughs> I'm kind of, you know, I'm like going through the script like this, asking questions. My, my list of thoughts and things I want to ask is, you know, can be stupidly long. So he was incredibly indulgent and we would have, you know, long phone calls on a, on a Sunday morning and go through everything for the week. And, um, I really appreciated that. I really appreciated that connection and that relationship. Yeah, and, and to that point of you kind of going in and, and combing through the script and creating that list of questions, uh, we were talking to David Diggs about the show as well, and he was, he was mentioning that you were one of the most prepared actors that he's ever worked with, and just the way that you would walk onto set kind of with everything ready to go for any moment. Um, and so I was curious about what that process looks like for you before you actually step onto set and like the time that you have where you're just sitting with the scripts and, and developing the character by yourself. So when you do walk onto set, you can be ready to jump into the scene, but also be ready for any of those changes that might come. Hmm. Um, well, I, I like to, I like to do as much work ahead of time as I possibly can um, because I like to be available to the moment when I'm on set. So I don't like to, I try to get all the things that are sort of in my head out of my head by dealing with them ahead of time if possible. So any questions about dialogue or why am I saying this or what's the, does this, you know, um, I love to go through that well in advance. Um, I don't, um, so, so I do that. And just in terms of preparation, like I, I also, I really enjoy the kind of process, the analytic process um, of sort of research and preparation process. Um, but I like, to, I like to do that so that I can just arrive at work and be there and see what, you know, the actors that I'm working with are bringing and see what happens on set. And um, so I'm armed, I have that in my, you know, in my pocket, but I, I don't have to be in my head so much when I'm, when I'm actually working. Yeah. What, what did that research process look like for this show in terms of, of the details and the aspects of this character that you wanted to do a little bit more background research on? Well, a lot of it is, um, you know, she's not based on anyone, any character in the film, and she's not based on any one character in the graphic novels either. Um, so she only exists in this iteration. Um, I did... You know, sometimes I, 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 I read stuff and I watch stuff mm -hmm. and half the times it's like to find out what I, who she isn't. Sometimes I find things that inspire me and sometimes I think they just help me kind of whittle away at what I think she, who I think she might be. And um, so a lot of it is just imaginative, honestly, and kind of um, trying to uh, 
piece together the clues that are in the script, the clues of where I know she might go based on my conversations with Graham, and my own imagination of who this person might be. Try to, I try to make it as concrete as possible so that everything feels uh, immediate for me. You know, everything feels specific. Um, and that's, it's really kind of a theoretical imaginative process mostly. Yeah. And I, I saw something where you were speaking to, you know, part of what you like to do with a character to be to really ground and understand the context of the reality that they're living in so that you understand the choices that they're making. And obviously a show like this is, is a wildly different reality to the world that we're living in, but obviously has elements of it. And, and so I was curious about the way that you wanted to understand that because that visual world doesn't exist until you step onto the set. So how did you kind of navigate understanding exactly what this was going to look and feel like for her? What the train was going to look and feel like? Yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't ima really imagine that until, um, until we got there and got to Vancouver and walked the stages and, and, um, and we had a little, pre you know, we had some time in pre-production. Um, but um, to do that. Um, but I had a lot of time to just think about where she had been before she got on the train, which is, you know, she's been on the train for seven years. So um, I had a lot of time to think about what her history was, where she'd grown up, what her relationships were, what she left behind, who she left behind, uh, the sacrifices that she made coming here. And, you know, just sort of more um, overarching questions about her nature, who she is, what she's hiding, what she wants, uh, what she's fighting for, and what her basic, you know, makeup is. Um, and then the sets were really extraordinary. I was um, really, I was really impressed by the work that they had done. I thought that there was so much, there, so much imagination and creativity in the sets, you know, um, so many different worlds just in that one train. Yeah, and with, you know, with each of the different carriages, they each have their own kind of ecosystem and, and purpose and, and visual look and feel to them, which was really interesting. And, and particularly in terms of your character, because this is her train, she's touched every single inch of it. And, and so I was interested in, in the way that when you were on set, you would kind of walk around the space because on screen, she's a character who has to walk into every single one of these spaces as if she's existed within them within seven years, has been part of crafting them and really just knows it very intimately. Yeah, um, you start to feel that pretty quickly. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, you know, especially her personal, I was really interested, especially in her personal space, her personal quarters and what was there. And, you know, I, I, I asked to have a few things put in there, some photographs and, you know, we talked about the way, you know, what it might be like, what kind of person she might be behind the scenes, you know, um, in her own private quarters. Um, and uh, yeah, we, you know, after we had a, we had a big tour of, of the of the stages, you know, all the stages as they as they came in as they were built, and um, you know, it's a train, and the train is a thousand and one cars long, which is a pretty big train, but it's still a pretty contained space. So um, you know, we had the time to become pretty familiar with it. Yeah, and because you were mentioning, um, you know, her private quarters and her private space, I was interested in the way that you thought about the duality of this character, because we see her in two very different ways. We see her kind of behind the scenes, but then obviously there's very much like a front-facing customer service hospitality version. So I was curious about how you built out those two sides of her, but making sure that they coincided and were really cohesive with each other. They don't necessarily coincide that much. Um, I think that one is really a performance. She's kind of adopted this persona um, as a means of getting, of, of accomplishing her goals. Um, and I think that the person that we first meet isn't the person that she actually is. And I think actually the person that we spend time with for the first few episodes isn't the person that she always thought she was. You know, I think that in reality, um, the character really evolves over the course of the season and I think she's been, she didn't, like, she's living a life she didn't think she was going to live, you know, like, she made some choices, and it set something in motion, and she's had to adapt. When we first meet her, she's this sort of distorted version of herself, and I think over the course of the show, and through her relationship with Leighton, I think 
she begins to reemerge and she has to, she's sort of confronted with who she's become and she's sort of, cha- she, and she's challenged. Um, and I think that, that her, a sort of truer version of herself ultimately emerges. Did you think about her in terms of a character that responds to situations in very much kind of more of a logical way than, than thinking about emotions? Because that's, that's what it reads when you're watching it on screen because her whole ethos is everything about the train versus her own self-worth and self-happiness. For sure. I think that she's deeply rational. Um, and I think that she, for better or worse, has really kind of really suppressed... Uh, a part of herself um, and she's not sentimental and I think she um, she's incredibly focused she's incredibly hardworking she's incredibly contained and restrained um, I think she cracks at certain points um, but I think that's her sort of baseline um, her base those that's sort of her baseline character did you find it useful to think about her in terms of, of who she would have been and the way that she would have approached a lot of these situations at the beginning of this train journey? Because obviously when we meet her, she's been there for seven years and, and you know, has almost had to become accustomed to some of the choices that she has to make in some of the situations that she's often put in. Yeah, I, I did. Um, and, um, you know, she didn't get on the train thinking she's going to, I'm going to be the voice of the train. She had to, she sort of came up with this way of managing the situation as she went along. Um, and yeah, you know, she's incredibly isolated and private. And um, yeah, I found her really intriguing as a, as a character, you know, she's really, um, She's challenging, but I found her really surprising and, and intriguing. So one of the things that I think is really interesting about her in terms of the character and the choices that she's had to make is, is this, you know, ecosystem and community that she's built, particularly in regards to the way that the different classes live in completely different environments and are treated very differently. And, and I was curious in the way that you thought about the choice in her decision making in, in forming that type of society, particularly as we learn more details about her own upbringing and her own background. I don't necessarily think she designed that system. I think that those were the, there were certain passengers who were meant to come on board. They were promised certain things. They had their tickets. Um, You know, it is, the train is our capitalist society. She didn't invent that. She didn't invent the class system that was built. That was not her, um, she was not the architect of the system. But I think she, chooses to maintain the status quo because she fears that things will fall apart uh, and ultimately sacrifice um, the ultimate goal, which is the most important goal, which is to keep everyone alive, to survive, you know? And she feels like the, the balance is very fragile. And I think she makes this really hard decision not to upend everything, you know, um, but to maintain status quo. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit as well about working with David Diggs and, and crafting the dynamic between those two characters, because one of the things that is so interesting is, you know, they- they first come onto screen together at a point where she really needs him and needs his expertise and skills, but obviously can't fully trust him and still needs to be very guarded about what information she's giving over. And, and you know, that, that flows back and forth to the point where he needs her at certain points. And so I was interested in the way that the two of you mapped out what those rhythms and, and beats were going to be throughout their relationship throughout the whole season. Um, well, we, could, we didn't have the luxury of really doing that so much together because, you know, the scripts were coming in um, as we were going. Um, So we couldn't, you know, like on a really concrete level be doing that kind of work together. Um, But, um, but he's very open and collaborative and generous as an actor. Apparently superficially polar opposite views. Um, And then we're thrown together. We need each other. And um, it turns out 
the deeper, the further they go, maybe they're not as far apart as, um, as we all thought, you know? Um, and I know for sure for my character, David is really a catalyst, you know, um, in the change that she un undergoes in the course of the show. Yeah, there's also a really interesting dynamic in terms of, of her relationship with a lot of the people on the train, particularly in terms of first class. And, you know, it feels like even after seven years that they still kind of view her and the rest of the staff as, as the help. And there's not really that necessary, like, emotional and human connection that you would think would exist after that amount of time. And, and I was curious how those elements informed the way that you interacted with each of those characters and developed that. Yeah, I think that, you know, she's very much... Um, I thought that her job, she's, you know, she's head of hospitality. She's like a concierge, you know, she's like she knows a little bit enough about everyone to kind of um, make everyone feel special and make everyone feel that they're being attended to and, um, you know, put out fires and, uh, but she's not, she's not really anyone's friend, but she's friendly with everyone and, um, and charming with everyone. Um, I think that she, she has this kind of funny relationship with, uh, with Ruth um, who's uh, next in line in, in hospitality, who works with her, and um, who's played by the phenomenal Alison Wright, who is uh, just such a joy to work with. She's so talented. Um, and uh, I think Ruth is kind of like the closest she has to a friend in a way, you know? Like, they're so different as, as people. Um, but I think that Melanie has a lot of uh, respect for her um, and affection for her. So we see little flashes of, of kind of connection within their relationship, I think, you know, and then of course it takes a turn later in the season. And, you know, within that, did you think about her in terms of, of the loneliness that she would experience being surrounded by all these people, but really always having a constant disconnect, especially with the information that she's having to keep very close to her? Yeah, but I don't think she really concerns herself with it much. You know, I think she is lonely, but I think that she's she's not a very self-indulgent person. So I don't think she mopes about it. I mean, I think if she stopped to think about it, she could acknowledge that she's lonely, but I don't think it's really, uh, I think it's kind of beside the point for her uh, being lonely. I think that she feels like she, you know, she's doing something important and that's what she stays focused on. And she's kind of, her her emotions are kind of irrelevant. Yeah, I was just curious about, you know, in, in terms of the way that you're, you're feeling that she has to really com compartmentalize and, and not concern herself with a lot of feelings of emotion, particularly with the loneliness, if that was similar to your thought process in terms of, of the trauma of some of the experiences of being on the train as well, because, you know, they're seven years in, there's been a lot of death, there's been a lot of, you know, terrible situations that she's been faced with throughout that time. Um, and so I was curious if, if that was the same thought process that you applied to that side of her as a character. Yeah, I mean, it goes somewhere, but it's not on the surface for sure. Um, and not only has she experienced it, she's been guilty of uh, causing some of that, a lot of that trauma. Um, well, I was just saying, I think that she, she, she can't, she does, she's, she does not confront the cruelty that she is a part of and the cruelty of the system. Um, and the human suffering until she has to, until the voices become so loud that it's unsustainable. This version of society is no longer sustainable. Mm -hmm. She's forced to hear those voices. And in that process, she, there is a reckoning and she takes stock of her own contribution and her own, um, and ultimately has to take responsibility for it um, and becomes a voice for change herself. You know, but yes, I think that the trauma that she experienced, you know, at one point she talks about love, you know, I think that she lost the greatest love of her life getting on this train. And I think that that did something to her. I think that she just buried it. Um, and then I just wanted to kind of end by asking you, obviously, you know, there, there is that season two and, and stepping back into it. What were some of the elements in, in terms of her as a character that you were most excited to step back into and, and revisit and continue evolving in her? Uh, she's kind of, she has, I don't know how much we're allowed to say, um, but she is kind of abdicated, you know? And as I said, she's become 
she's, um, you know, become an, she's become an advocate for change. And, um, and she becomes a different version of herself. I think a truer version of herself. We find her sort of doing uh, the thing that's really her calling. Um, she's confronted with new challenges. Um, uh, but where she starts from, from uh, the, the version of Melanie that we see at the beginning of season two is much closer, I think, to the person that, um, that she always thought she was. Um, yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking time to, to talk to us about the show and, and all of your work on it. Really, really appreciate it. And I hope that, you know, you and your family have a really wonderful rest of your week and, and it's not too crazy. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for taking the time and watching the show.